Hey guys, it's Anne. Welcome to the channel. Now, today we're going to be taking a look at Blue, who's right behind me there. And also, please note, I do have a Plant Obsessed t-shirt. If you want any of these or related merchandise, the link is below. Alright, so we're going to take a look at him, evaluate him, see if he needs any food. Can we get a harvest out of him? Let's find out. Let me go put you up and we'll take a look at Blue. Okay, here we are back at the bin. So, uh, if you're new here, this bin was made from a 55-gallon food-grade barrel that we uh, cut in half long ways and then put the two ends together. And uh, this has been going continuously for well over a year. And I don't harvest this bin like you would a normal bin where you just kind of uh, start all over again every so often. This is what we call the wedge method. And so what I did was I started at this end of the bin and put the food and the bedding. Let's just say there. And then the next time I came in, I put food and bedding here. And then the next time I came in, I put food, oops, food and bedding here. Eventually, um, after it builds up a little bit, you get all the way to the end. And then you start back. So once we get done looking at this, then what we do is we will harvest a little bit of this and scoot everything over towards the more finished edge. If you have any questions about the wedge method or how I do it, uh, let me know. Now I don't do it perfectly as it was intended. As it was intended, you build things and you progress along never looking back. Well, I can't do that. I'm way too nosy. I need to know what my worms are doing. So. I do a modified wedge method. So if you wanted to do a normal wedge method and you can possibly not look in your, on your worms every couple of weeks, then what you would do is you would start and keep going, never looking back. And the, the worms do kind of move along with the food as they go. All right, but that's not what we do here. We do the modified. So let's have a look and see if I can get any castings right now. So let me kind of push all the dry stuff in the middle here. And then I can get my little pan here to put on the side. And then I have my one quarter inch screen that I use to uh, take a little bit of the castings off. It's best when you're doing this to just do a little bit at a time. The screen will get bogged down if you try and put too much in at the same time. So I also use this as an opportunity to pick out any, uh, you know, labels or little plastic that's made it through the shredder. And then uh, these items will be put back at the opposite end to get recycled. So you can see this has been going for more than six months and you can still see some of the avocado shells and uh, pumpkin seeds. Um, I think that's maybe even a cherry pit. So not everything makes it the first time around. So basically I take off what I can and then I recycle it at that end. The worms will get around to it eventually. Um, that's just the way I operate it. Some people would be perfectly willing to allow, you know, these larger clumps and, and, and things to go into their garden, but I usually sift everything and uh, just let the worms keep going at it until they get it done. So it looks like I'm not getting a big percentage of stuff, so we're going to do just a tiny little bit and then, then we will get to it. And then I just did exactly what I told you not to do, which was put a little bit too much in here because I'm impatient and that's what happens sometimes. But it does give me an opportunity to pick through and get rid of anything that should not be in there. I think sometimes maybe some of the cardboard I use must have some sort of uh, something on it that makes it not get digested readily. So. I go ahead and pick that out as I do it. Okay, well that's not a bad haul. 
Now with the one quarter inch screen, you will have cocoons in here, um, which I can then sift through a smaller screen if I wanted to capture them. Okay, so the next part of our procedure that I do here is that I'm going to look through this, this bin here and then I'm going to evaluate does it need any moisture or what. Now this stuff here I'm trying to eventually harvest. So I don't really want to uh, add any more food here. Uh, we're just keeping it aerated, keep the moisture even. Now one of the things that I did want to mention, um, some people are super passionate about fluffing versus not fluffing. And one thing that I can tell you is that this is an artificial environment. Um, and even in a normal compost bin, you're supposed to turn it once a year or twice a year, depending upon what you've got going on in there. And that's no different than what I'm doing here in this artificial environment. Now, as some of you know who have been here for a while, I have been reading some textbooks on vermiculture as well as on worms themselves. And one of the things that I've discovered was that uh, my fluffing actually, um, it has a couple of different benefits, if you will. Now, one of the things that it does, you know, that I always knew I was doing was that I'm adding oxygen. But one of the things that I didn't think about is that I'm also releasing gases that might hurt the worms. Now, the process of composting does, you know, create carbon dioxide. It does create um, ammonia, and those type of things are dangerous for the worms. And so by going through this, I'm actually releasing all of that, and that is benefiting the worms as well. So even though some people are very passionate about the fluff to no fluff concept, I just wanted to tell you that there's a whole other reason that it is a good idea. Now, how often do I really need to do it? I don't know probably do it more often than I need to. But that being said, there is a good scientific reason for doing it, which is to release any of the um, gases that build up during the composting process. Okay, so I'm just kind of going to do a quick fluff here and move things over to make a little bit more room for the feeding end. And then I will put my avocados back. Looks like I still have some roots here. If you're new here, um, for some reason, I like to uh, grow avocado trees, even though I'm in zone five. Uh, the worms eat most of them. When they get to a point where I can see that they're not going to grow, then I usually, I'll put them to the, the food end and let them go ahead and finish eating them. I do have uh, about four, maybe five avocado bonsais. So fun trivia about me. So looks pretty good. We just did this about 20 days ago. So I wouldn't expect there to have been any sort of huge change, but we are at the change of seasons. So it's for the best that I keep an eye on things so that it doesn't get too wet. The moisture in the bin does go up as the humidity in the basement goes up. Or rather, it doesn't release its moisture as readily, one of the two. So another sign that spring is here is that the seeds in the worm bin have started to germinate. If I had to bet money, I'd say that was a pumpkin. Um, <laughs> just a lot of seeds and everything take, you know, six months to a year to break down, and uh, sometimes they start growing. Now, in my bin, I will, because it's not warm enough to try and grow this outside, I'll just pick this and toss it back in, and they can use it as food. Okay, so let's do the reveal over here underneath the blanket that they've been using. So let me move you over. Okay, so here's the blanket. I call it a blanket over here where we fed last time. So I'm going to pick this up and move it. And you can see that the worms have been making nice castings right here. So we're going to move all of this dry bedding down and keep shifting everything and moving it along. So this is where you get into the wedge part. I'm basically wedging everything that way. We do try and keep the active food section, you know, over this way. 
So I'm just trying to remove everything that I know isn't probably food. But you can see the concentration of worms is much higher here than it was, you know, probably a foot that way. So we might be getting to the feeding zone here, so we're going to go a little slower. Not sure. I think this might be like a plum or something. I did look at the old video, and we fed quite a bit of oranges, plums, and celery. So we might be getting into that. We also might run into possibly a bit of pineapple, which, believe it or not, has been in here for like 65 days. So nice and, this is very wet right here. So let's kind of dig under and see what we've got. So, oh, okay, wait, wait, aha. So there's the worm ball. And it, Looks like it's still in the pineapple. Here's an orange, or is this, no, this is an orange. So here you go with the forbidden food. I don't know if this is an orange or some other kind of citrus, but once it gets degraded to a certain point, it's not in any way dangerous for the worms. If they didn't want to be here, they wouldn't be here. So we're going to keep plowing through the food here. And I don't know if you can see that there's a lot of different creatures in here. You can see the uh, pot worms and the arthropods. And the blue worms are just getting all wiggly. Now, K Connecticut Worms was trying to show an example of a super blue worm. Sometimes you can't tell the difference between a blue worm and a red wiggler. And sometimes they are very pale and sometimes they are super blue. But look at this one. Um, he's dark grape color, you know, like Concord grape color. But not of them, all of them are that way, and I actually don't know what the difference is. But that is a really great example of a blue worm right there. And uh, he's very pretty, sparkly. Okay, so we're just going to keep plowing through this seeing if there's any leftover food of substance. This is more of the pineapple. Pineapple is definitely a slow food, definitely, definitely. Um, you don't expect the worms to go through that even in a couple of months. What is this? Oh, plum. So apparently they really like plums. They are absolutely rooted in there. I'm not going to like try and upset them too much, but they're literally rooted in that plum. <laughs> Okay, don't know what that is. But we'll just keep moving things along. See if we find any other worm balls. Now, because this was super dry last time, because of all the harvesting we did, I did add water. So if this is looking super more wet than you're used to seeing in my bins, that's the reason. It was because all of the harvested um, siftings were super dry. So tried to add enough water to make sure that um, the worms could get a second crack at it and start eating again. So we've got basically just an insane amount of worms here. I just love it. I know some people are like, oh my god, that is so gross. Put on some gloves. But I just love, um, I don't know, it's probably spring fever, whatever you want to call it. It's still cold outside. Um, but I just love having my hands in, you know, I know it's worm castings, it's not dirt, but close enough for me. So these guys are doing fabulous. So we're just going to move them over and keep rolling with it. Now this bin has probably, I'm going to estimate at this point, probably has 15 pounds of worms in it. I don't even know what the maximum amount of worms is that I can get in this bin. I don't know what's, what's logical to think of, but I know that I have a ton, a ton of worms. We don't have any problems locating worms in this bin. So it looks like we've still got plums and pineapple and some oranges. Again, don't, don't let anybody tell you, oh no, you absolutely cannot feed citrus. These worms did this of their own free will. Um, I think some people 
you know, hear one rumor and then they just get completely dogmatic about it. Um, in the wild, they would eat oranges. It's just the way, you know, they eat what's around. And if it's something that bothers them, then, you know, they will wait it out until the rest of the microbes and fungus and arthropods get in there and they eat it up for them. And then the worms will eat what is left. So, yeah, this is a lot of worms. Good worms, look at that. Out of all that food, we put in three pounds of food last time. And I'm just finding a few little remnants of oranges. And I think a little piece of pineapple, maybe. So we're moving this on over. And then we're going to check the very end here, where all the sticks and stems usually are. Um, somebody also asked me, do you really expect a worm to eat this stick? No, <laughs> I do not expect a worm to eat this stick. What this stick is doing is it is holding all of the good bacteria and the fungus and it soaks into this wood. And so when I put brand new bedding in here or brand new food, all of the microbes that the worms need is already in that stick. So it does not have to build up the population in order to get the proper amount of microbes that are needed in order to eat that food. So just think of it as yogurt. It's a probiotic for worms. Um, that's what it's doing in there. It's, it's not because I really think the worms will eat a stick. I mean, something's going to eat the stick eventually, but that's, that's not really the whole point of having the stick in there. The point is that it's, it's like a probiotic that keeps the good bacteria and everything um, present in the area where I am doing the feeding. Okay, so we've got our old food, we've got our sticks and stems, we've got that dry bedding here. Let's get them some food. All right, here we go. The worm's god mama, Cece, has provided us with more pumpkin. In April, no less. So uh, the worms are getting an absolutely unprecedented amount of awesomeness this late in the season. Okay, and since we have uh, built up this end pretty quickly, I am going to add some grit to this. So you can tell that we added probably three or four gallons of the prepared bedding over on this side last time. So we're going to give them a bunch of uh, prepared bedding again here. Now my prepared bedding is uh, shredded junk mail, Amazon boxes, you can see the coconut coir. It does have some grit in there, but I also make it with some castings and some kelp meal so that the microbes have something to chew on until they get into the worm bin. And I did want to give a shout out to my husband, who is my uh, executive producer, as Vermicompost Learning by Doing says of his wife. He does all of the mechanical stuff behind the background, shreds everything, processes the eggshells most of the time, and uh, leaves the rest of the on-camera stuff for me. Okay, so there we go. We have got everything covered up. So, if you like blue and you think maybe you would like to watch a whole bunch of blue episodes, go ahead. I have a playlist right here. If you want to just go see what happened last time and how fast did they eat those oranges, I will link over here to that video. And if you want to see me build blue, me and my husband, I will also link that video down there. If you like this video, give it a muddy thumbs up. If you're not a member of my worm family, click that subscribe button. And if you want to know what I'm doing when I'm doing it, ring that bell icon. Alright guys, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms, and everybody, have a good day.